All right, so this is the end of chapter five. This is the rest of chapter five. And um, presumably then we'll be looking to tie together some of the themes that we've been uh, talking about um, over the last uh, couple lectures. So we are going to talk about uh, a little bit more in depth at any rate, um, going back to the uh, organization of life. Okay, And uh, there's a couple different ways, or more so a couple different levels uh, to look at it. We introduced you to the uh, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species thing. And um, certainly that is, is one way and a, and a way that most of us are comfortable with organizing life. Um, but there's actually bigger groupings. And I may or may not have alluded to them the other day. I forget. But uh, so the first way uh, to look at another, it's not another way, it's just, a, it's just stepping back even further from the kingdom phylum class order thing, uh, to the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes. And you may have heard these words um, conjugated a, a couple different ways, prokaryotic, eukaryotic, uh, prokaryote, eukaryote, as I said. That's usually an individual. Um, and <coughs> they're groupings, and they mean different things. They have different characteristics. We, and pretty much everything you know, uh, are eukaryotes. Okay? Uh, bacteria are prokaryotes. So what makes a prokaryotic organism different? Well, it lacks organelles. Who can remind us what organelles are? Little parts of cells, yeah? Do they have uh, special functions or anything? Or why, why do we have them? What's cool about them? So the organelles is it's basically a division of labor uh, inside of the cell. And um, it allows for uh, them to be more efficient, uh, be more, uh, do more things. Not even just be better at doing things, but do more things. <coughs> and um, it allows just overall then, it allows for specialization of cells. So you end up with these multicellular organisms. Not that, not that eukaryotes, um, we don't have a, a single cell out here or there, okay. But... Prokaryotes can't get really advanced. Um, so not only do the cells lack organelles, they lack a nucleus, which means their DNA is just floating around willy-nilly. It's a mess. Um, and they are bacteria. But it has some benefits. I mean, it wouldn't still be around if it wasn't beneficial, right? That's sort of the argument we've been making all along, is that the bad stuff gets put off to the side. What's the benefit of this? It's really easy to reproduce. It's really easy to make more of yourself. Very simple. When you keep life simple, life is simple. It's just that simple. Um, eukaryotic, all right? Well, they have organelles. We just talked about organelles. They have nuclei in their cells. Uh, and as I said, it allows for a much more a uh, complex way of life. It allows for cellular distinction. Um, it allows for complex organisms to evolve. It allows for people to stand outside of your door and whistle when you're trying to talk. Um, it, it allows for a lot of things. Uh, and obviously, again, the complexity must not be a negative thing. He's gone. He's gone. He's gone. It's all right. Thank you, though. All right, so so another way another way of looking at life are domains. Uh, they didn't if they if they had domains when I was taking biology classes, they didn't talk about them. Um, you guys grew up with domains, is my understanding, and somewhere in between um, the early to mid '90s when I was last in college to uh, the mid 2000s um they started you know domains went mainstream um 
They are the uh, the archaea, um, the archaebacteria, the eubacteria, and the eukaryotes. Okay, so basically they divided the prokaryotes into two uh, domains. And again, this is new stuff uh, for me when I was putting this PowerPoint together. Um, I think I've told you before we had a different name even for bacteria back then. But uh, the, the archaebacteria were uh, just another type of bacteria. Well, again, as technology improves, we're able to learn more about things. Um, I think I mentioned, you know, space is a great example when we were talking about how science changes over the years. Um, telescopes get better, we learn more stuff, right? Well, as microscopes get better, as we're able to study genetics more, we learn more stuff. So apparently somewhere along the line they figured out that these archaebacteria, archae means old, archaeologists, you heard that word before. So archae is ancient. Um, and these guys were the first, that, that part hasn't changed, the, you know, the, the cyanobacteria, the, the blue-green bacteria, you've probably heard about them. Um, these things are different enough from all of the other bacteria out there that they decided that, hey, this is so important, we need to draw um, not just another phylum like they used to be, okay, but these guys need to be even a different, you know, kingdom, so to speak. <coughs> so, not the preview of this class by any means to discuss the hows and the whys, but these archaebacteria, at any rate, are really cool stuff. Uh, they were the first thing on the planet, they're going to be the last thing on the planet. They live uh, extremophiles. They live um, inside of volcanoes. They live uh, inside of ice, mile down in the earth. <coughs> they live on the bottom of the ocean floor at the deep sea vents. They live everywhere that things usually can't live. When we get around to acknowledging that there's life on other planets, it's going to be, at the very least, these guys. I mean, they found water and, on Mars. Yeah, well, <coughs> excuse me. Throat uh, is uh, not feeling great today. Um, we found ice at any rate, and uh, there's obviously evidence that there was flowing water on Mars. We have like sedimentary, we have sedimentary rocks. Yeah, there's not there's not lakes that we've found. There might be underground reservoirs, maybe, but um, there definitely was at some point because again we see old dried up riverbeds. We see sedimentary rocks. You can really only do uh, that kind of stuff with flowing water. But um, there is certainly some some icy water left there, and same with the moon. Um, you know, there's there's no liquid water, but there is frozen water. But um, and again, at some point we will see, uh, you know, these acknowledgement of these organisms. Um, more than likely, they'll be in the archaebacteria realm, if it's life as we know it, with those you know the air quotes there. So, uh, three domains at any rate. Kingdoms you're familiar with, okay. Uh, you know the plantae, animalia, fungi, uh, protista, some people remember, some people don't remember. Um, those are our, uh, typically what you think of the single celled kind of guys, okay. Uh, the protists. And then we've got the bacteria and the archaebacteria. I still see little use for domains okay I, I like my kingdoms but um, it does show again how the the eukaryotes then uh, are every and this is how I split them up on here for you too so um, you've got one domain here one domain here and then all of this is in another domain I separated the protists out though because of their uniqueness and we sometimes finally refer to them as planimals and they're, they're not really plants, they're not really animals, they're <clears throat> very unique kind of thing. So it used to be pictured down outside the lib uh, library, biology lab, uh, I think it's still there. Uh, some stuff that you grew up in, in science class, your teacher probably showed you some of these little single-celled uh, organisms. Neat guys. The, the fungi, of course, those are your, your, your mushrooms and the like. Uh, plantae is, is plants uh, and animalia. 
damn, it's not exactly a foreign language, but you know, <laughs> nonetheless. So we're going to go through some of these a little bit here. Uh, some, again, less familiar than others. Um, your, your protists are mostly unicellular. There are some simple multicellular critters in there. Uh, and again, it's it's a fairly interesting if you if you dig this kind of stuff, it's interesting at any rate. You know the fact that um, the little wiggly tails that some of these guys have, the flagella or whatever you want to call them. Um, arguably, they, someone would argue that it was a uh, a free living organism itself at some point, and it merged with the uh, remaining part of the, the that new organism. They made a new organ, and that's how we build up this simple multicellular life. Um, but uh, neat stuff. Uh, al anyhow, algae. Algae are not plants. A lot of people think algae is plants. It's not. Uh, protozoas. That's a word you know. Uh, and slime molds and water molds. Again, probably stuff that you um, yell at for being algae or you slip on it in a, uh, on a stream you're walking through trying to rock hop or something and you slip on some slimy stuff. Ah, damn algae. Eh, it might have been a slime mold. You never know. So protists, you know, you're some protists. Uh, the fungi is not just mushrooms, okay? Also yeast and mold, all right? Yeasts and molds, that surprises some. We love our yeast, whether it be in breads or beers. Wouldn't be a very happy planet without yeast. Mold mm, makes for good cheese, makes penicillin, what? Yeah, some of them are good, though. Some of them are good. And again, I'd like to think plant A and animalia don't need explanation. So again, just to show you what's going on here, um, bacteria... They're moving off as as more different um, than. The, the, how can I explain this without you guys having the whole? Uh, where they put these lines on these things actually is important. All right. So the fact that they separated uh, regular bacteria all the way over here from the archaea and put archaea much closer to the protists it actually means something in this diagram. All right. It's important. Um, it means we're much closely related to blue-green bacteria um, than we are to um, uh, Staphylococcus, something or another. I can't think of a bacteria at the moment, but uh, it means something. All right, and then the fact that all these guys are clustered over here, of course, means something else. So that's the idea here. Um, and these branching structures do imply a little more than just where they branch off from. All right. All right. And most of you probably won't recognize this guy, but he was quite famous for saying, and now for something completely different. All right. Um, so interactions between organisms. Symbiosis, mutualism, commensalism, parasitism, predation. All right. Some of these words sound familiar. Some of them may not. Um, again, we're in the context of an ecosystem. We're in the context of uh, niches. All right. And how these all work uh, together, how it all works out. We'll touch on each of these words. So, symbiosis, uh, any intimate relationship or association between members of two or more species. And that's not intimate in the way we typically use the word intimate. It just means close, okay? Um, so, any close relationship or association between members of two or more species uh, we can refer to as a symbiosis. Uh, mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism are all types of uh, symbiosis. Uh, I'm not sure if I conjugated that correctly or not, but symbiosis is certainly isn't right. <clears throat> so I, I am guilty of this as anyone. Uh, I use symbiosis very generically to mean um, 
uh, well, we'll see what I mean in a minute uh, when we actually define the words correctly. Um, but m m a lot of people, myself included, sort of misuse symbiosis. Uh, we should be saying mutualism or commensalism. Um, nobody ever means parasitism when they say it, I can tell you that. Um, because symbiosis generally means a positive thing when you hear the word, right? And we've got a real symbiosis going, or however you use it in your everyday life. Uh, you certainly don't mean something negative like parasitism. Uh, but as it turns out, hence my point, um, parasitism is a type of symbiosis. So, All right. So in the symbiosis, uh, individuals of one species usually live in or on individuals of another species. Uh, our gut bacteria is a great example we mentioned the other day. Never really thought about it, but again, bacteria are living organisms. That's why antibiotics work. They are living. I think what we have problems with is, is calling them organisms, right? I think arguably we could say that's the issue. Um, but, uh, you know, what else comes to mind? Well, if you're watching National Geographic and you see these wildebeests out in the middle of the, the plains of the Africa or wherever they live, and you see these birds living on them, right? And the birds are eating the bugs that live on the, the wildebeest. They always show us that. Um, that's a great example. You know, the bird gets food and the, the wildebeest gets the bugs taken away. So that's what we're used to thinking, but again, it can be nested like we have now. We've got these bacteria living inside of us, and um, they help us. We're helping them. We're feeding them. So at least one species uh, uses the other's resource. Sometimes it works both ways, and that's where we see these variations, those three words that we're going to talk about in a minute. So the partner, the symbiont, uh, either benefits is unaffected or is harmed. So one species um, is the, the host, that's not here, uh, then the other is the, uh, the symbiont. Uh, we're arguing in this case, this is why it's related to the previous conversation, that symbiosis is a result of coevolution. All right? Uh, the interdependence of two interacting species. An example you are probably quite familiar with is flowering plants and flying insects. Okay? Sorry? Yes. Okay. So it's the stuff necessary for plants to do their reproduction. Just keep it simple. All right. And insects have uh, go from plant to plant to, to eat their food. And um, they quite often have um, features on them that allow them, that actually attract pollen to them. Little teeny tiny hairs on their legs and on their bodies that the pollen sticks to. All right. And um, yeah, it's nowhere near time to go. People are getting antsy. Um, so they argue quite frequently that the plants never would have done as well uh, had there not been insects um, evolving along with them. Insects would not certainly have gotten as popular as they, they have if they didn't have these, these flowering plants that were more than happy to give them um, food <coughs> in exchange for traveling their pollen. Because, yeah, pollen certainly gets in the air. Lord knows many of us know that you know with allergies uh, come springtime and, and so on and so forth. Pollen certainly will float around, but getting pollen into the right spot, that's something different. And the insects would perfectly do that perfectly well. So that's coevolution, uh, and the idea is that there's a lot more examples out there than just those two guys. Oh, well, here you go. Got a whole slide on pollination for you. So flowering plants evolved to attract pollinating animals. Uh, this is where you get in the whole conversation about bright colors and so on and so forth. Uh, pollen is the male reproductive. See, I couldn't remember that. That's why I have a slide for it. Um, so it uh, produces food, nectar, and pollen. Uh, the, the bugs are there for the, uh, the nectar, all right? Uh, but they take the uh, pollen with them to the uh, other plants. They use things such as bright colors and scents, which is exactly why we like flowers, coincidentally. Um, something you share in common with insects. Um, and then um, 
believe it or not, and this is this was uh, surprising uh, for me when I first learned this. Um, they are rather animal specific. Certain plants will attract. You may have noticed this. Certain plants will attract certain types of insects to them. We had one plant, and I can't remember. I want to say it was a hollyhock, which was arguably pretty for some point of the year, and then they left these horrible stalks everywhere. They were filled with ants, and you never think of ants as pollinators. I don't, at any rate. Um, and I couldn't figure out when nothing else would go to them, right? But it was a certain scent. Um, what do we have, for example, here, bees want a 30 to 35 percent uh, sugar concentration in their nectar. They, they favor that. Okay. Uh, you may know uh, just from, again, being a hobbyist or whatever, that butterflies like a certain kind of plants. Well, more than likely there's a smell they're associating with it, um, uh, a certain amount of sugar, lack thereof, so on and so forth. Um, there's, it's very animal specific. And uh, again, that sort of ensures that your pollen gets back to the same kind of plant. Neat stuff. All right, so let's talk about these. Mutualism. This is typically what we mean when we say symbiosis. So different species live in close association, provide benefits to one another. Both parties benefit. Uh, what do we got here? Nitrogen fixing bacteria and legumes. Everybody knows that one, right? No. Um, but here's the thing. The, you, you're supposed to rotate your crops. That you may have heard of. All right. Uh, that's because certain um, veg vegetables suck out. Same thing over and over and over again out of the soil. Well, you throw in uh, uh, some beans, and beans will, at the very least, uh, replenish the nitrogen, okay? Um, because beans have this thing going on with nitrogen-fixing bacteria. It, it all works out. We're actually um, going to show you some equations about it later on, unfortunately. Um, but it is a huge thing called the nitrogen cycle. It's very important. So um, uh, the bacteria that live in the roots provide nitrogen for the plants. Uh, and the plant provides sugar to the bacteria. The one that comes up in my field, of course, is the uh, blue-green bacteria. Okay, uh, they were the first life on this planet, so I talk about them in geology. Uh, the green part of the blue-green bacteria, the cyanobacteria, uh, is um, our chloroplasts. Okay, Can they conduct photosynthesis. The um, uh, the bacteria that they live in, the chloroplasts live in. Uh, have a uh, produce sugar. The uh, I'm sorry, they don't produce the sugar. Um, the uh, oh, it just jumped out of my head. The equation here. <clears throat> the photosynthesis provides um, uh, oxygen, which nobody needs. Uh, provides sugar, which the bacteria like. There we go. I had it backwards for a minute. Um, the uh, bacteria then provide uh, carbon dioxide, which the um, you need for the photosynthesis. So it's it's a sort of a nice little circular loop there. And here's just another example of it. So mutualism, both parties benefit. That's, in the end, the multiple choice question that you're going to see, right? Commensalism. One benefits and the other, eh, they're okay. They're not harmed. They're not, you know, getting something out of it either. Commensalism. And sometimes that happens, but we don't usually use the word symbiosis for that one. Silverfish and army ants. I apologize, I don't remember the story to go with this one. Tropical trees with smaller plants growing off the bark. Yeah, that, that we've all seen, if not in the movies. Somebody's going through the jungle, okay? But maybe you've spent some time in the woods and you've seen the uh, toadstools, uh, the lichens growing off of the sides of trees. Um, you've seen algae you know, growing on, on trees. Or if you've spent any time down south, they, they definitely have um, a lot of, of hanging vegetation that, that lives in the branches. And as long as, you know, that's not blocking out photosynthesis, as long as it's not um, wearing away at the bark, okay, uh, it's not hurting the tree at all. Um, but it has a st st safe, stable place to live. It doesn't get stepped on, you know, all kinds of benefits for the for the uh, lichens and whatnot. So that's commensalism. Um, 
But I really, I don't remember the Silverfish and Army Ants. Left. I don't. I've, I've got to delete that one of these days, or at least remember to look it up before I have this conversation. It's probably in your textbook. That's what I used to write this PowerPoint. And everyone's favorite, at least the one we know the most about. Everyone knows parasites, right? Um, one organism benefits, and the other is not only not benefiting, but is harmed. Okay. Uh, you, typically, the scenario is the parasite receives nourishment from its host. Um, a parasite never wants to kill. Okay. A parasite wants to keep you alive, so it doesn't totally drain you of your, your wherewithal. But um, it's certainly, you know, you're not doing great for it. Um, ticks, tapeworms come to mind. Uh, if any of you are, are fisher persons, um, there are these little sucker fish that attach themselves <coughs> and to, to larger fish. Uh, lampreys uh, is an extreme example of that. And uh, I, I apologize, I've been talking too long this morning, I guess. And coffee is not, not revitalizing. But it is wet. So, if you pull up a fish that has one of these guys on it, you are not supposed to throw it back in the water, okay? Uh, you are supposed to kill it, and you're actually even supposed to <coughs> report it. <coughs> I'm told more often than not, though, you see a fish that has these sucker bites on it. Um, and again, I think you're probably supposed to report that. And I don't know if you'd want to eat it. That's, that's your call, I suppose. Uh, those are open sores, open wounds. But um, there is... Certainly, those guys have worked their way into the lakes that uh, you don't even have to go into the Great Lakes to see that. They're, they're all around, unfortunately. You had a question? <clears throat> um, I don't know if termites go into living or dead trees. That's the problem. Uh, yeah, if the tree is living, then yes. I just know, uh, I mean, I know there's termites out there in the world. I'm more familiar with them as a household pest, yeah. in, in which case, you know, that wood is obviously long dead. Um, but if the tree is living uh, and you get these giant termite mounds out in the, out in the, the wilderness, um, yeah, that would certainly uh, count as that. But I want to say, and, and don't quote me on this, that they move into dead, dead stuff. So no, but um, they would be down in that... Uh, Decomposer realm there, or at the very least, a tritivore. But, I don't know. So, ticks, tapeworms, um, the, uh, 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 um, sucker fish we just talked about. There's lots of examples out there. And, and, predation. Predation. I want to get through these and then we'll call it quits for the day. I just want to finish up predation here. Um, so consumption of one species, cut right to the chase there. You are totally, you know, not just is this bad for you, you're dead. Um, consumption of one species by another, predator and prey. You, you've heard those words since you've been watching TV probably. Um, this is um, uh, animal to animal. It could also be. All you vegetarians out there, you are killing something. You're killing plants. You yep. just, just can't hear them scream. Okay? Um, so predator and prey. You, you know, a, a, a sheep is a predator. It, it's killing something. It's killing grass. At any rate. Um, so consumption of one species by another, predator and prey. Uh, it can be animal to animal. Typically... Carnivore to herbivore, obviously there are some carnivore to carnivore. There's omnivores in, in the mix there. We're just trying to keep things simple right is now. That is inter, uh, that is same species. Cannibalism is same species, yeah. And um, somehow every one of my classes every semester we end up on cannibalism. I don't know how. It happens in my home, too. Cannibal, it comes up, comes up conversationally. You know what are you going to do? But uh, yeah, no cannibalism. Um, you've got to be in this in the same species. 
So, um, anywho, so carnivore to herbivore, carnivore to carnivore. Um, you know, obviously a, uh, 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 and you guys will correct me here, my kids always do, a, uh, a tiger, to, a cheetah taking down a gazelle. I may have my con I may have my continents mixed, but a deer with long horns. Yeah, but uh, kind of like a deer. But um, pardon my continent mixing, but nonetheless, you get the idea. We we've watched this on on TV again hundreds of times, um, and uh, even even how about plant to animal? Does that occur? No. Got Venus fly traps. Yeah, well, it's still animal. Bugs are animals. So, but after I got is it that. intentful? Well, it was designed to be at any rate. Whether or not that, whether or not that that fly trap, and there's others. I think there's a pitcher plant, and uh, there's a couple others that that will uh, that trap meat, for lack of a better word. Um, you know, it's not sitting there going, come here, little buggy, come here. It's not probably consciously thinking that. Um, but I mean, but the, the, in, the, the intent by design yeah. and the trigger hairs and yeah, so on and so forth. Yep. So it doesn't hurt. I'm not big. doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, so, like, don't touch the possum. Yep, don't touch the possum. You can probably pet a Venus flytrap, though. Don't. Please don't sue me if it hurts, but. Um. All right. Um, how many more? Yeah, again, we're leaving just a little bit here, but this is <clears throat> too much for my voice today. So I'm going to call it quits here.